Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. I'm going to be preaching from Hebrews chapter 9, and the title of the message today is this, The Tabernacle Was Partial, The Church is permanent. The first point in my message today is this. Everything about the tabernacle was partial. Hebrews chapter 9 starting with verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A temple was set up. In its first room were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. Well, the writer of Hebrews didn't want to go into detail of those things, but just was reminding the people about this tabernacle that the people had in the wilderness many years ago. The tabernacle was a portable uh, tent type structure. Uh, it was a pretty, it was a very elaborate tent. It wasn't just a uh, easily portable. But it was portable and they took it with them. The tabernacle of worship was very different than today. Uh, No one just went to church. No one just got up and got dressed and went. There was all types of advanced preparation. Now, within the tabernacle, there was no socializing as we know it. There was no welcome time like we had. There was no senior recognition like we had. There was uh, no piano, there was no choir, there was no Sunday school, there was no announcements, were no announcements, and there was, there was no worship service as we know it. It was very different. It was a completely different experience with what we, wor- with what we experience as worship today, yet it still had the ultimate end, which was the worship of God, the forgiveness of sins. Now, the prescriptive rules for worshiping in the tabernacle were so detailed that no one dared break them. No one dared break them. And probably there is, there's probably not one person here today that would be ready to worship in the tabernacle. We would have to go through ceremonial cleansings and different things. Also, the tabernacle was male-dominated. And women were excluded from many things. Now, in my experience as a pastor, a church staff member for many years, I've been in church a lot of times where uh, people come to fix up things. People come to express their own ideas through different things. We've got a, a quilt ministry, these beautiful banners that we have on the wall, people... Uh, uh, created and put up here and we love swapping those out and uh, they're just wonderful things that help remind us of the Lord and people come to volunteer to paint they, they, they come here to mow the grass and then also through the years I've, I've known, recalled people who, who donated things to the church some of those things were okay and some of them weren't that great I was in a church one time that had a piano in every room and all of them were broken People got tired of their piano and said, we don't want it anymore. Maybe the church wants it. But people did not donate castaway things to the tabernacle. Now, <clears throat> Numbers chapter uh, 1, you don't have to turn there, but Numbers chapter 1, verses 48 through 51, tell us about the Levites. You see, all these things that I mentioned, the maintenance of the temple, uh, any type of work that was done at the temple. Th- this was done by 
Levites, maintained by Levites. The Lord said to Moses, listen to this, exempt the tribe of Levi from the census. Do not include them when you count the rest of the Israelites. You must put the Levites in charge of the tabernacle of the covenant along with its furnishings and equipment. They must carry the tabernacle and its equipment as you travel and they must care for it and camp around it. Whenever the tabernacle is moved, the Levites will take it down and set it up again. Anyone who goes too near the tabernacle will be executed. <laughs> wow, that's a little different than today. I wonder what would have happened back in the day if somebody donated their old beat-up piano to the tabernacle. If you came too near it. So there wasn't any room for non-Levites to participate in volunteerism in the tabernacle. It's a much different situation today. We need volunteers in the nursery right now. We need volunteers in our children's department right now. And to my knowledge, we have no Levites here to do those jobs. We need you. Now, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 9, starting with verse 6. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year, and never without blood for which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, listen to me, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. There is so much jam-packed theology right there. We could spend weeks talking about it. The priests of this day had to be well rehearsed for their work. And when the priests were at work, they did not tell jokes. They did not tell stories. They didn't visit anybody. They had one reason for living, and that was to be the mediator between sinful man and a holy God. It was their whole reason for existence. Now, only the high priest could enter this, this inner room. And the, the high priest performed specific functions that he had to do perfectly. The, the high priest entered this holy of holies and, and he wore bells. I've read that where they wore bells. And they, they wore these bells so that people outside of the holy of holies could hear them moving around. And if they didn't perform this ritual, the ceremony perfectly, they would die and the bells would quit ringing. Well, how do you go get a priest that's fallen over dead in a room where no one else is supposed to go besides the high priest? Well, they had that figured out. There was a rope around the priest. And if the bells quit ringing and it became silent, they knew the priest was dead, and they pulled him out. Well, Probably some of you have sat through services long enough that you wish that you had a rope around the preacher so you could drag him out. But this tabernacle and its rituals were shadows of things to come. People who participated knew that what they were participating in was a foreshadowing or a looking forward to the coming Messiah and his finishing work of salvation. Now, this is really difficult for us to wrap our heads around. Uh, they, they did something. They, they participated in a worship ceremony while hoping for something in the future. But none of them knew the time when the Messiah would come. Now, 
I tried to think of a way to illustrate this, and about the, the best thing that I can come up with is this. It would be like a couple that gets engaged to be married, stays engaged forever, plans a wedding, but never sets a wedding date. This is how the people function. Verse 9 is a real curious verse. Look at verse 9. It says, This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Now, think about this verse. If you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you know what it's like to be forgiven. If you've sought forgiveness from someone else and they forgave you, you know what it's like to be forgiven. If you've extended forgiveness, you know what it's like to forgive. Even though we have Jesus who has forgiven us of our sins, how many of us are still haunted sometimes about our past? Even though we're forgiven. Now, can you imagine how much more haunting it was for the people in this day when the scripture clearly says that the sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper? You see that their, their sins would be forgiven outwardly because of the animal sacrifices, but they knew that someday, perhaps many years after they died, a Messiah would pay the price for their sins. Now, everything about the tabernacle was partial. But everything about the church, listen to me, is permanent. Look in verse 11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made... That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Now, I just mentioned in verse 9 where the animal sacrifices did not really relieve the consciences of the people, but here in verse 14, we see that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ cleanses our consciences. Now, I want everyone to try to understand this as best as you can. Today, we have hope, the hope of the forgiveness of sin from the Messiah who came years ago. In the Old Testament, the people had the hope of forgiveness for the Messiah who had not yet come. And I am so glad that I live on this side of it all. Because having hope in a Messiah that has already passed through this earth Amen. is easier for me than having hope in a Messiah that will come and forgive me of my sins someday, possibly hundreds of years or a thousand years after I die. Because I can say that on this side of history, it's already been done. Now, there were... The people of the Old Testament were given signs to look for for his first coming. And we are given signs to look for for his second coming. Verse 15 says this. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. That those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance... Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. If you underline or circle things or highlight things in your Bible, mark those four words. For this reason, Christ. That's the turning point. That's when all of history changed. So the Old, the Old Testament people were forgiven of their sins... 
in a sense, <laughs> but not completely. And you may want to argue that point with me, but, but the scripture even tells us things like this. And it's really even hard to put into words. They were forgiven because they followed the rules about the sacrifices, but they weren't totally forgiven until the time of Christ. They were forgiven by faith, just like we are forgiven today by faith. A ransom is paid for someone who is held captive. And it says that Jesus died as a ransom, verse 15. So under the old covenant, people were held captive. They were held hostage for their sin until the time that Christ set them free. No wonder at the time that Christ died, the dead came out of the graves and marched through Jerusalem. Now the question is, did these old people, these Old Testament people go to heaven? Yes, they went to heaven on the promise that Jesus would pay the penalty for their sins. Now, here we are on this earth, and we are caught, for lack of a better word, we are caught in this idea, this reality of time and space. We, we remember the past, we live in the present, we hope for the future, but we don't know much about the future. So past, present, and future is really our only way to perceive things. We, we cannot see outside of the past, present, and future. So I want you to do your best to try to think outside of the past, present, and future just for a second. Revelation 13 verse 8 tells us that the Lamb, meaning Jesus was slain before the world was created. How was Jesus crucified before the world was created? When he was crucified 2,000 years ago on this earth. It's really mind-blowing, isn't it? One writer said this, the reality is this, the blood of Jesus was shed for us before the creation of the world, but only revealed to us when Jesus was crucified on the cross, died, and rose again. Now, I've done my best in the last few months to preach to you in understandable terms. And I hope that everyone here has a basic working understanding of this wonderful work of Christ. As a Christian, you should have basic working understandings of these things. One, really, you should know the Old Testament, the purpose of the Old Testament law and the purpose for its day. And you should know how the law pointed out man's flaws. And you should know how the people yearned for a Messiah to save them from their sins and all those laws. And you should know how the work of Christ changed everything. If you don't know how the work of Christ changed everything and you've been in church all your life, I'm not sure if there's any hope for you. <clears throat> earlier, I, earlier I talked about the tabernacle. Listen to me. The church is so much more than the tabernacle. And I'm not talking about the tabernacle as a portable structure. And I'm not talking about the church as a building. I'm talking about God's people. Today's church is open to everyone, not just men. It's open to non-believers who want to come in here. It's a place of joy, music, Sunday school, instruments. And you know what? Sometimes it's a place of fun. Amen. <laughs> right? All right. Say that again, Fred. Amen. That's right. A few years ago, I remember there was a boy in church. He was full of energy. Most boys are full of energy. And like many boys, he ran down the hall in the church. He wasn't hurting anything. There was no crowd. It was an empty hall. And one man yelled at him in a booming voice, Do not run in God's house. Now, I did not know exactly what that man meant. Because you know what? God does not live in the church building like he did in the tabernacle. God's house is in the hearts of his people. Probably what he should have just said to the boy is, 
hey, don't run inside. You know, the church is a place of freedom today. And yes, there's plenty of room to run if no one's standing in the way and nothing will get hurt. Now, if I were with that boy today, I would take him to an empty hallway and I would tell him to run back and forth until he's tired of running. <laughs> because there's freedom in the church. We don't have a tabernacle today. We have a church. We've got a, a very different place. We worship the same God in a different way because of Jesus Christ. For this reason, Christ. Now, the tabernacle was good, but the church is better. The old covenant was good, but the new covenant is better. The old law was good, but Jesus is better, and Jesus is the guarantor of that covenant. Praise God. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the dynamic word that we have here in Hebrews chapter 9 about the saving work of Christ and about how things changed and were fulfilled because of Christ. Lord, I, I look at these Old Testament, this tabernacle and the work of these Levites and the rituals and everything that they did and sometimes I think, I, I don't think I would even be able to do it. I would not have been able to live up to it. But I'm so grateful that because of Jesus, I don't have to. Thank you, Lord, that you saved me a long time ago. Thank you for coming into my life and forgiving me of my sin. Thank you for giving me a purpose to live. I pray for people here today who who need to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and repent of sin, that right now, wherever they're sitting, they're asking Jesus to forgive them. They're asking Jesus to be their Savior. They're wanting to set aside the guilt and shame that plagues their conscience because of what Jesus can do in His healing power. They're wanting to look forward. Help us all to look forward to this day that Jesus will return and then our salvation will be actualized. We believe it now. We believe it by faith. We know it to be true. Lord, we thank you for that day in the future when the clouds will part and Jesus will return. As we enter this invitation time, Lord, I pray that your will would be done. I pray that someone would come to faith in Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have another decision you'd like to make, if you need prayer, if you'd like to join our church or talk with us, uh, the invitation is open to all. Let's stand together.